Hey, it's Mr. Spencer. We're going to go over winter dreams here. Some summary and some commentary, all right? Dexter Green. Last name sounds like a part of a golf course. Anyway, Dexter Green. He's a 14-year-old caddy at the Sherry Island Golf Club in Black Bear, Minnesota. Remember how the other story we read, Bernice Bobs Her Hair, also by F. Scott Fitzgerald, author of The Great Gatsby, started off at a country club that has its own golf course. Man, this is like... The idea of golfing, what a rich upper class motif that Fitzgerald plays with a lot. I wonder if there's a golfer character in The Great Gatsby. We'll have to find out next week. So we're in Minnesota, which is also the state that F. Scott Fitzgerald was born in as well. The Midwest. Now, Dexter, his father owns the second best grocery store in town. So Dexter is solidly middle class. Not lower class, not upper class, but solidly comfy in the middle class. He's by no means rich. One day when he's caddying at the golf course, all right, getting the balls and carrying the clubs for the richer guys, he meets the lovely-ish Judy Jones. At the sight of Judy, he decides to quit his caddying job. He resolves to follow his winter dreams to become the kind of man who would fit into Judy's winter world. Wealthy world. <laughs> Sherry Island the place where it takes place in Minnesota, it's the perfect place for this story for Fitzgerald to work on his themes. Remember I said that Winter Dreams is basically like a prototype for themes Fitzgerald would explore deeper in his novel The Great Gatsby in the next few years. Okay, he published this story right before he started working on The Great Gatsby. So Sherry Island, this golf club, First, the natural loveliness of Sherry Island ties the ideas of beauty and money together in Dexter's mind, they've become conflated and maybe in a dangerous way. Where there's beauty, there's dough. True enough for Judy Jones. All right, so Sherry Island, but it's winter time, so we're a little colder. Not the most welcoming, warm place we'd expect the golf course to be. It is Minnesota. So second, Sherry Island allows us to imagine the class issues of the story geographically. In other words, Dexter's from this black bear village. And we are sure that Black Bear Village is a very nice place, but it gets essentially no description from the narrator. It's like the narrator doesn't even think it's significant compared to this fancy golf club. It's a place of no importance in Dexter's imagination. On the other hand, Sherry Island, where all the rich people live, makes Dexter feel magnificently attuned to life, he says, radiating a brightness and a glamour that he might never know. Again, Sherry Island is the place where Dexter goes when he's dreaming of improving his social and financial standing. The fact that Sherry Island is close to the place where Dexter grows up reminds us of Dexter's own class background. He's middle class, but his origins are humble. He wants to spend all of his time at Sherry Island, but he can never forget that he comes from somewhere else. He does not yet belong in the rich world that Sherry Island symbolizes for Dexter. And the comparison between Sherry Island and Black Bear Village is similar to the comparison between New York, which is an important setting in The Great Gatsby, and Minnesota, where Fitzgerald is from and where Dexter's from. In other words, like Sherry Island, New York City, and specifically Wall Street, where they do all those investments, represents this space of richness in comparison to cold Minnesota, more thrifty. Dexter starts off in Minnesota, but just as he left Black Bear Village, he moves on to bigger and better things. And as a Minnesota native himself, Fitzgerald is highly aware of the social differences between St. Paul and New York. So the golf course is also probably the most obvious symbol in winter dreams. When we think about golf, we think about money. Belonging to a country club is a long-standing sign of privilege in American society. So Fitzgerald's keenly aware of this. Dexter goes to the golf course to earn some extra cash as a caddy, but he doesn't really need that extra dough. What he really wants from the Sherry Island Golf Club is a chance to watch the daily habits of the rich and successful. Dexter's job at the golf course provides material for his winter dreams. So at the beginning of Winter Dreams, the Sherry Island Golf Club represents everything that Dexter wants to achieve. The golf course and his eagerness to be on it symbolizes wealth and high status. And by the second section of Winter Dreams, the golf course has become a transitional space where the newly rich Dexter tries to remember what it was like being a boy caddying there. What happens once Dexter finally has the chance to golf on the course? Is it everything he'd hoped and dreamed? 
So again, Dexter resolves to follow his winter dreams to become the kind of man who would fit into Judy Jones' wealthy world. If you haven't finished reading the story, you got to finish reading it, all right? Okay, this is just, I'm going over basically the first chapter. But there are two important notes I'll make of the first chapter, all right? I encourage you, before our quiz, we're looking for examples of short and long sentences, informal and formal language, syntactic literary devices such as juxtaposition, antithesis, and parallelism. All right, so you'll notice in the opening paragraphs, Fitzgerald has established a restrained, sad, or lamenting tone at the beginning. It's restrained, though. He's careful. He's not throwing all of his literary techniques and all of uh, the tricks up his sleeve out on the first few pages. Okay, it's a bit restrained. Okay, keeping his cards close to his vest, if I can make that poker metaphor. But as we move through the story, by the end of the first chapter, and you get into the the, the page four, we're going to see a little more indulgence. Once we get to the dialogue, just like Bernice Bob's his hair. Bernice Bob's her hair. Just like that story, Fitzgerald gets more playful and the tone starts to evolve when we get more dialogue between the young characters. It's almost like the narrator is older, more wistful. And by the end of chapter one, that first chapter ends on page four, the tone has shifted to become more nostalgic, wistful, and indulgent. All right, so you got to finish reading the story. It's not so simple as that either, the narrator says. As frequently would be the case in the future, Dexter was unconsciously dictated by his winter dreams, his intuition pushing him. Note, we have a third person, seemingly omniscient narrator, third person point of view. It's not first person point of view. So pay attention to the narrator's tone. The narrator's tone will be different than the tone of the characters in dialogue. Does that make sense? The narrator is not Dexter. So he resolves to become the kind of man who would fit into Judy Jones' wealthy world. And in the next few chapters, Dexter and Judy both become older. All right. So years later, after college, Dexter invests in a laundry business in the city nearest to Black Bear. Not the sexiest job in the world, but he makes a boatload of money and he starts hanging out with the wealthy families of Sherry Island. He meets Judy Jones a second time a few years later when she accidentally hits one of Dexter's golf companions in the chest with a golf ball. Oof. Later that evening, Dexter bumps into Judy on a raft in the middle of Black Bear Lake. This sounds more romantic. She asks him to join her for dinner and Dexter, of course, eagerly accepts. At dinner, Dexter confesses that Judy confesses, I mean, that she's a bit blue or sad because a man she really liked turns out to be poor. The horror! Dexter assures Judy that she he is well off or rich, and she leans over to kiss him. This is very similar to how Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda had their courtship. Now, Dexter in the story realizes that he has wanted Judy Jones ever since he was a teenager. At this point, Dex is head over heels in love with Judy, and even though he knows that she has other lovers, he puts up with it. After a year and a half, Dexter finally gets it. Judy doesn't actually care about him at all. She will never return his feelings. So he gets engaged to a girl named Irene Shearer, a nice but slightly less attractive girl, the narrator points out, with a friendly, welcoming family. Does he settle? Not so fast, though. When Judy turns up again, asking Dexter to marry her, not cool, Judy, like he's already getting married to Irene. Well, Dexter practically trips over Irene to begin, once again, his affair with Judy. Judy and Dexter's rekindled romance lasts for only a month. He moves east to New York the following year, and when the Americans join World War I, Dexter signs up for the army. He's glad to have a distraction from his pathetic personal life. The poor guy actually prefers the trench warfare to the webs of tangled emotion, as the narrator points out. Flash forward seven years, we're near the second half of the story. From Dexter's failed engagement to Judy, he's 32 years old. I'm 33. Man, is this middle-aged yet? Uh, is this a midlife crisis yet? He hears from one of his business associates that Judy Jones has become Judy Sims. Is she married? Mr. Sims apparently drinks too much and cheats on her. Oh, and one other thing. She's not the cutie patootie she once was. Dexter is horrified. Oh, the horror. To hear that Judy's beauty has faded. Is this an important value of the story? Is there a theme we could draw out of this? 
He understands that his winter dream has gone forever, and he's no longer the idealistic young man who loved Judy Jones. All right, you got to finish reading the end of the story. And there are six chapters noted through Roman numerals. All right, I put footnotes in there to explain some complex ideas. Those should be helpful. And it's about 15 pages. All right, there are notes there also that will tell you how to read this on Kindle. So if you want to check that out, it's a free app. You can read it on your phone or if you have an iPad or tablet at home. The Kindle app is free. Okay, so I put some of those instructions there under the text and stories folder to help you. This is Mr. Spencer signing off. Send me a message if you have any questions. I'm getting so lonely here.